you know, they, they, they don't want things that particularly are going to help working families like health care, education, public safety, which are going to raise costs on folks. Look, MAGA Republicans also refused to raise a single penny in new taxes on the wealthiest people. But Republicans may be the least of his problems. Progressives in the Democratic Party are becoming a major thorn in Joe's side. They are slamming the president on crime and immigration. First, Biden sided with Republicans to block that crazy Washington, D.C., insane soft-on-crime bill liberals who wanted to fund the police are furious. Republicans are taking advantage of the split. 173 House Democrats voted to support reduced sentences for violent crimes. So crazy, even President Biden won't support the anarchy. What's next? Defund the police? Biden is also getting slammed for considering a policy that would detain migrant families at the border. And here's AP with the kicker, quote, Biden's re-election bid facing resistance from some Democrats. Okay, Jesse, I absolutely have to start with those MAGA Republicans. They want to take away the law. They want to defund the police. You know, in addition to being evil, they really want to, they want to destroy your life. Is this working for him? Um, I don't know. They poll tested MAGA, so they're going with it. But I'm bored already talking about the budget. <laughs> <laughs> this is happening every single year. So the Democrats come in and they say, we're going to raise taxes on the rich. And the Republicans come in and say, you're not going to raise taxes on the rich. And then neither side cuts spending. And then the debt blows up. It happens every single time. The left says, you don't care about poor people. You don't care about minorities. And the right says, you guys don't care about the budget. And nothing ever happens. And we're going to play the same game, and he's going to propose something about tax hikes, and the Republicans have the House, so that's not happening. And the Republicans aren't going to cut defense spending, and the Republicans aren't going to cut Medicaid or Medicare or Social Security, so you got to cut discretionary. And then they can't cut discretionary, because every time you cut, a, cut discretionary, they get accused of being heartless, soulless Scrooges. And then the Democrats... They, they're not going to cut taxes. They want to raise taxes, but they can't cut them because they don't have the House. So this is just, it's BS, and I'm sick of it. Biden is smarter than I'm giving him credit for because all of a sudden, after the midterms, he's tacking back to the center mm -hmm. on crime and immigration, and the left's all mad at him. But it doesn't matter because the left hates him. Only like 30% of the Democratic Party wants him to even run for re-election. But that's all they have, because without him, they have Kamala and Mayor Pete, and that's a disaster. You know, uh, Harold, the truth is that, that Biden is kind of in a tough spot now, because now <clears throat> he's saying, you know, uh, that, that it's the Republicans who want to defund the police, which is so ridiculous. I don't even want to ask you about that. But the idea that now he was, he was against the D.C. area, reducing the uh, uh, crime limits uh, terms, and that's going to make the progressives upset. He has to walk two lines here. You know, I don't think so. First of all, I'm very happy to be back it's around this table. It's, it's, it's been a while, so it's good to see everybody, and I'll be thinking Hi, about yeah. you guys. Um, I, the thing that Jesse said, I think, is most interesting. I want to answer your point. There's nobody running against him but Marianne Williamson. So when we talk about resistance, uh, until someone else gets in the race, you'll hear people talk. You'll always hear people talk. you got a Republican primary where you have a bunch of people talking about running, a few people in the race already, if not two. Uh, so this is what happens in politics. But Jesse's right. The moment we're at right now with the debt ceiling, there's a huge fight about whether we should con try, to, try to negotiate. Republicans should try to negotiate, make Democrats negotiate to tame spending, to reduce spending, to increase the debt ceiling. We should increase the debt ceiling, but this is the fight we ought to have right now because the debt ceiling, that money's already been spent. Democrats and Republicans ought to get down to the, to the real business of figuring out if you're going to cut spending either for mandatory spending or the non-mandatory spending, the discretionary or the non-discretionary. It'll be interesting to see if they have the courage to do that. Just but we're in a eyes are glazing over. But, but, we're, but we're in a, as I'm saying, you're right, but we're in a political season now. So you're going to hear Democrats say certain things, Republicans say certain things. President Biden is making it clear. He's for fighting crime. He's not for defunding the police. He's for funding the military. He's for investing in manufacturing and infrastructure. It will be interesting to see how Republicans 
answer that. Uh, I hope they have robust and serious answers because, because the country needs it. The only way we're going to avoid this debt ceiling debate, which is a silly debate like we're having right now, is for the debate to happen right now, for compromises to be made, and for everyone to understand you can't reduce the debt by just raising taxes, as Democrats some want to do, and you can't just reduce the debt by reducing spending, as some Republicans want to do. It's going to take uh, a, a coordinated effort. The first thing I would do if I was Republicans, make the Democrats take all that unused COVID money and make, put half of it towards deficit reduction and half of it towards either military spending or and, and or reducing the Medicare and Social Security deficits that we have. That's how I would start. All right. Go ahead, Sandra. Uh, you know what else President Biden is for? Imposing more spending in a moment of sky-high record inflation. We got here because of big government spending. I mean, think about the remarkable moment that that was today. The president goes out and demonizes the rich, says they need to pay their fair share, says he's going to raise the rate that corporate, uh, the corporations are paying, their corporate tax rate's going to go up. So he's going to tax everybody, increase revenues, when revenues aren't the problem. Spending is the problem. So think about that. And who is he running against? It looks like he's running against members of his own party. This, the, Jesse just mentioned it. The number is 37 percent. The Associated Press says just 37 percent of Democrats nationwide want him to seek a second term. That's down from 52 percent that wanted to run for re-election just before the midterm elections. So there is a big drop in, in, in popularity no and favorability. Him, no I, I, you know what? You understand my point. Right. But if we impose more spending during this time of sky high inflation, you're going to be in a much different economic situation just even a few weeks, months down the road, and that is going to put Democrats in great peril if people are still paying these sky-high prices. Well, there's no question, and they're going to see that kind of thing uh, in the supermarket, at yep. the gas pump, everywhere. But, you know, Greg, Biden came in as a moderate. He said he was a moderate, and then we've got Bernie Sanders saying he's the most progressive president in history. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that he's, he's trying to dance a line, you know, I'm, and now I'm glad that he's changing if he wants to fight crime. But is it going to win for him? Well, he is the most progressive president in history, and he did uh, perform as a moderate during the election. So he did both, right? He, it's called lying. Uh, <laughs> and it's good that he sided with the Republicans finally with crime. Maybe some of them are coming to their senses, but it's because it's where they live, right? Their policies are directly consequential because it's in D.C. That's where they live, right? So why can't this be done in other cities? Because it doesn't affect them. And this is, again, another example where they change the way they view things because now they're the ones that who could be the victims, especially when the congresswoman was, was victimized months ago. Um, in terms of the budget, I think we have to stop calling it a budget, right? It's identifying as a budget, but when you get its clothes off, it's not, okay? It's, and it can't, what is it? it? It cannot be considered. It's a boat without a bottom. It's technically not a boat if there's no bottom, and there is no bottom to the budget. How can there be an achievement? How can you boast about getting a budget together when there are no restrictions to what you budget? When you haven't allotted, when you haven't said, okay, we have this sum of money, and these are the things we want to pay for, which is what every person does at home. We just can't print money. Yeah, we just can't print money. Yeah. And, and so what ha it's amazing. It's just amazing to me that we pretend that this is an achievement. Oh, look at this. Look, look at the job we did. No, you didn't do anything. You just went through and picked all the stuff you wanted, and then you come up with a number with these, like, these numerological chemists that are coming up with this stuff. But they just, you know, this is not a budget. There's no sum of money that you then allocate to different purposes. So it's not a skill either to come up with this. It's all a joke. And the worst thing about it is when you see people pretend like it is an achievement, when all they're doing is putting a gun to the taxpayer's you know, head, basically. I mean, it's just figuratively, but if you don't pay your taxes, you go to jail. They take our money, and then they give it to the constituents like they're Santa Claus, and they act like they did it. It's worse than joke stealing. They're basically <laughs> stealing, they're stealing people's hard work and they're pretending, pretending that it's coming from them. That's very but good. I Go just, ahead. I just wish the Republicans would offer, I, I agree with you, the Democrats, this is not a serious budget yeah. and because you can't, you don't have all this money, but the Republicans won't offer a counter. They just say what's bad. I was in that place. You got to offer a counter and then let's debate it out and whomever wins is going to win. Well, you know, it's the president who's a Democrat.
you know, and, and I think Republican it's really too. his job. A can't miss, see, and I cut you off right Congress there. A can't time. miss interview tonight on Hannity at 9 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> Our colleague, Benjamin Hall, sitting down with Sean to talk about his new book, Saved. Ben describing the moment his car was hit by a missile in Ukraine. We slowed down an abandoned checkpoint, and out of nowhere, the first missile came out of nowhere. <laughs> Lands about 30 feet in front of us. Mm -hmm. Immediately, Pierre shouts, reverse the car, reverse the car. There were two Ukrainians driving as well, and five of us in the car. The car got stuck, we couldn't go back, and Pierre shouted, get out of the car, everyone get out of the car. And the next second, the second bomb hits, pew, right in front of the left of the car. And that one, I went black. More of Benjamin oh. Hall's interview tonight on Hannity. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox.